challenge from Jesus Christ was simply follow me. The second week we looked at the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus taught about prayer. He taught about ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find and knock and it will be opened. And what we don't realize is following that statement of encouragement and prayer and to keep on praying is the golden rule. What we've, what we've named the golden rule. And that shows us how that our prayer life affects our uh, treatment and our interactions and our relationships with others. That we should plan to pray, and only then can we show the love of Jesus Christ appropriately. And then the Sunday that we were uh, not in person together, uh, we, we took a quick look at the Pharisee and the tax collector, and how that we're not supposed to compare ourselves with others and realizing that we have nothing to offer in exchange for God's righteousness, but by repentance we receive it through his grace and mercy by our faith in Jesus Christ. And then last week we took a look at Nehemiah. We saw that when worship is neglected and God becomes less important, undesirable things take priority. Vows and promises are broken showed us that a lack of accountability causes a vacuum in which sinful behavior increases and the things of God begin to diminish in a person's life. So with those thoughts in the back of our mind, today we're going to take another look at the person of Peter. Peter is probably, uh, aside from, from Jesus and, and maybe you know John the Baptist, one of the most forefront characters in the New Testament until until Paul's writings uh, arrived. And, and Peter, knowing that he spent uh, his time in ministry with Jesus, you know, I think a lot of us, as I've said before, can really relate to Peter because he was a, a, a ready, shoot, aim kind of guy. Today we're going to look at Peter in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 puts us in the setting of the Last Supper in the upper room with Jesus and his 12 disciples. They're eating, they're talking, having conversation, they're listening to Jesus, and he says this, Behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. Now, you know, they've, they've, they've seen Jesus do all these miracles, they've heard Jesus talk about, you know, the, the day and the hour is not yet here, you know, only the Father knows the time. And, you know, they're, they're thinking, well, we're going to celebrate Passover, we're going to take a day or so off, and then we're heading on to the next town. Well, things are getting kind of, kind of dicey for uh, them to be traveling in and around the area of Jerusalem. Uh, and so they're, they're ready to, to move on and minister in the next town. But Jesus says that statement. That, that the one who's going to betray him, the one who's going to sell him out, is their hand is at the table right now. The same table that Jesus' hand is at. <coughs> and this statement begins to spark a debate among those twelve about who it is, and in their minds, more importantly, who it isn't. They discuss and they dispute amongst themselves who would be considered the greatest or the best of his closest 12 followers? Jesus reminds them that the one who serves is the greater. And he refers to himself as the one who serves. Now, mind you, they've been having this discussion, and they've been building their individual selves up, and they have been speaking with louder than usual 
talking voices. And all the while, Jesus is trying to prepare them and to inform them about what is about to take place to himself. And as we know it through the reading of the word, very soon. He tells them, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones. Which probably was about to restart that I'm the greatest, I, so I get to sit next to Jesus at the table debate. After they had all just kind of passed around, well, that's not me. I mean, I've been with Jesus for three years. I've been with Jesus three and a half years. You know, I, I was there when he called Philip. We were sitting over there under the tree. And, and you know, well, um, you know, I introduced a couple of you guys to Jesus, so maybe I'm the greatest. You know, they're, they're all involved in their, their self. And Jesus just... I really wouldn't say nonchalantly, but, but with intent and great purpose, drops this following statement right in their lap. And they have to deal with it. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32. Jesus gets their attention by calling out Simon Peter's name. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift you men like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And notice there in verse 31 that he addresses Simon. He calls out Simon, Simon. Two times. So we kind of get the idea that maybe if he has Simon Peter's attention, he has the attention of the other 11. You know, Peter's kind of the <laughs> spokesperson for the group self-appointed. He's kind of the, the, the loud and, and, and boisterous one of the crowd. So when Jesus gets Simon Peter's attention, he has the attention of the rest of them. And he just, he just tells them, Satan has demanded to sift you men like wheat, but I pray for you. <clears throat> I pray that your faith will not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brother. It wasn't just Peter who was in danger. It wasn't just Peter who, was, who had been demanded to be sifted like wheat. In verse 31, the use of the word you is plural. Kind of like we say y'all. Satan has demanded to sift y'all. All of you is included in that. <clears throat> Jesus was speaking to Peter in an effort to let the entire group know that it wasn't just one single person that night who was going to betray him. The name Satan means adversary or accuser. He accuses God's people of doing wrong. It's almost like an attack. And you remember what he did to Job back in the Old Testament account of the life of Job. But when he says in verse 31, Satan has demanded to sift you men like wheat, you kind of have to understand what that means. We kind of have an idea of what sifting wheat is. You know that, that when, when wheat is, is picked and when it is gathered, modern day, that the grain is separated from the rest of it. Same principle, in biblical times, the grain has to be separated from the rest of the, 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 the wheat plant. So in biblical, <clears throat> in biblical times, Wheat and other grain was sifted through a large sieve or a large strainer. It was violently shaken. The dirt and other impurities that clung to the grain during the threshing process would separate from the good and usable grain. Sifting also involved what is called a threshing floor. And we know that in biblical days they didn't have any mechanical machinery. Everything was done by hand or by animal power. So 
After the harvest, the grain would be separated from the straw and the husk by actually beating it manually. That was, that was the, the, the single most uh, effective way. It was doing it by hand. Just take a stick, a log, lay out the weed on a hard, flat surface like a rock or maybe uh, where, where some, uh, maybe some logs had been, been put together to kind of make a floor. And they would just beat it and bust it open. A lot of times uh, they would take the sheaves of wheat and lay them out on the threshing floor. And they would bring their oxen across it and let them step on it. Maybe pulling a cart so the wheels would roll over it. And maybe help speed up the process. Maybe if they didn't have oxen, they would, they would herd their cattle through there. And, and let them step on the grain, to, to the, the, the sheaves to... to expose the grain and then uh, after loosening up the edible part of the wheat grain from the scaly and inedible chaff that surrounded the, 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 the husk that surrounds it the winnowing forks kind of like what we picture in our mind as, as, as a large rake or maybe like a hay fork they would take and they would scoop up everything that had been pressed or beaten or trampled over and they would throw it up into the air. And the grain would fall out and the other stuff would kind of float away because the grain was heavier than everything, the housing and, and the stalk and, and everything that surrounded on, on the stalk of wheat. And so this is the picture that Jesus was giving to the disciples that, that Satan wanted to do to them. He wanted to sift them like wheat. He wanted to run over them. He wanted to beat them up. He wanted to throw them up in the air and watch them fall to the ground. He wanted to separate them from Jesus. By sifting Peter and the other disciples like wheat, Satan's goal was, was to crush them, to, de to defeat them and wreck their faith. In truth, the adversary wants to destroy the faith of every believer, not just those 12 that night. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But he said, I came so that they would have life and have it abundant. Satan wants to see us down. He wants to see us Busted open. He demands, as Jesus told Peter and the other eleven, he has demanded to sift you men like we. He demands to knock us down. He demands to run us over. He demands to beat us up, to throw us up in the air and do it all over again in an effort to shake us apart or break us down. Years later, Peter would write in one of his letters, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be of a sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, I don't know about the rest of y'all, but you know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll take a look at one of those National Geographic documentaries. You know, about the African savanna or you know, something like that. I just, you know, those things are neat and interesting because you know, we're, we're so far away and so far removed from that type of thing that, that you know, the only chance we'd ever have to experience it is, you know, maybe, maybe through the TV. But if you've watched those, you've watched those documentaries about lions and how that they behave and, and how that they interact <coughs> with, with each other and how that they interact with their prey, you know that the lion does not roar when he's on the hunt. He's very quiet. He's very subtle. He's very sneaky. And just like your you know, average house cat out in the yard watching a bird, he gets really low. And he creeps. And he creeps. And he creeps. And when the prey least expects it, he pounces. And that's exactly what Jesus was telling them that night that the devil wanted to do to him. 
Only after the hunt, after the lion makes the kill, does he begin to roar. It's almost as if he's letting the whole world know that he's succeeded. He now has a meal he can now devour and feast on and relish in. But it also lets all the other predators around know that, that, that he's the king. He's the top dog. And they better not come around or they'll get the same thing too. So you see, sometimes the prey, it'll play possum. While the lion is roaring and celebrating and, and, and running around in his, his circle, letting the whole world know that he succeeded, the prey will, will, will get up and trot away. And the lion has lost. He's not succeeded. That's just what the devil has done. He celebrated prematurely. If you go all the way back to Genesis, in, in the garden where God makes a promise of redemption. And he tells Adam and Eve, and he tells the serpent these, these one particular uh, statement. He says that, that, that the, the, the adversary, the devil, Satan, is going to have his head crushed. He's going to bruise the heel, but he's going to have his head crushed. So it's only a temporary victory. You know, the lion might, might pounce on its prey, a gazelle or whatever, but it hasn't finished it all. Satan uses those tactics against us, and he throws everything that he can think of. His playbook is wide, it's long, it's deep, but it's the same old stuff he's always used. Death, disease, despair, doubt, anxieties, uncertainties, hopelessness, cancer, physical problems and ailments, mental health issues, substance abuses, prodigal children, pornography, infidelity, insecurity, selfishness, and pride, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. But he's roaring in celebration. But he's not succeeding, not yet. And he never will. When Jesus told those men that night that he's demanded to sift you, and he was talking about all of them, what he didn't tell them, what he didn't say was that he didn't promise that he was going to remove this kind of a test. See, when it comes to Satan, there's no, there's no tactic that he isn't willing to use, no line he isn't willing to cross, no angle he isn't willing to take. And he'll try and just simply try and wreck you using any means necessary. But, but Jesus told those men that night that, that, that he had demanded to sin. But he didn't take away the experience. On the contrary, he predicted that Peter would fail. He said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows in the morning. Trials are to be expected in the Christian life. In Acts chapter 14, verse 22, the missionaries say, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. He's not talking about missionaries. We're talking about getting to experience heaven. But he's talking about making it to the place where, where God's kingdom has been set up on earth. Where God's rule is the ultimate rule. And Satan is finished. So, so number one, Jesus didn't promise to remove this test and this temptation. But what Jesus did do is this. He assured Peter. He says, I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. And so when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Whenever we 
do experience a test. Jesus is, is using that test, but he's also there with us to strengthen us and to intercede for us. You remember what Philippians 4.13 says, right? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So we can face anything. We can stand up against the tactics of the adversary. In challenging times, it's reassuring to remember that Satan's power to sift Peter and the others like wheat was limited by Christ's intercession. And that's, that's something that we often forget. That we have an advocate at all times, not just in the hard times. Jesus was also confident that Peter would get back up again and go on and strengthen the other disciples. Another reason that we are allowed to experience and, and, and go through a suffering experience of testing is so that we can learn how to help others grow in faith. What you've gone through, you can walk with someone else as they go through it because you, you've been there from the beginning to the other side. And you have the faith and the confidence to know that, that the good Lord has, has seen you and blessed you through it. And so now you can in turn invest in someone else. You can patiently endure and suffer. But it's just for a momentary while. Our true faith and our perseverance are not revealed in a walk of sinless perfection. But rather in repentance and restoration. Like Peter, we get up and we keep going after we fall. We get up and we keep going after we fail. When Satan comes... To sift us like we, we have an advocate who's prayed for us. Jesus told Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. You see, Peter's faith was never in question. Peter had faith. But he failed. He said, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Shortly after Jesus told this to Peter and the other disciples, before leaving the upper room that night and heading out into the evening, Jesus prayed with and for all of his disciples. In John chapter 17, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read you um, a couple of verses from there. As Jesus begins to pray, he asks God these words about his disciples in verse 15. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them away from the evil. And so he had already prayed for Peter. And again, he prays for all of them collectively. And then he goes on in verse 20 of John 17, and he says, I'm not asking on behalf of these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, through their ministry, through their preaching. And he says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So Jesus not only prayed for Peter, as Satan has demanded to sift him like wheat. He prayed for the other 11, as Satan has demanded to sift them like wheat. And then he goes on and he, he prays for them and for their ministry to go out into the world. And he prayed for all those who would come to, to a saving faith in Jesus Christ because of their ministry, because of their testimony, because of their preaching, because of their writings. He prayed for us. He will protect us so that the devil can never destroy our hope, so that the devil can never destroy our faith. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who come to God through him, 
since he always lives to make intercession for thee. So he not only prayed that night, but he continues to make an intercession for us even to this very day. Rest assured and, and, and have hope and confidence in this, that if Christ has began a good work in you, he is faithful to complete. That's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ Jesus, meaning he would complete it by his return. Now, in the historical time frame of that night, about 50 days later, this would have been after the death of Christ, his burial, his resurrection, and even his ascension back into heaven. Peter and the others are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter preaches the, the good news of Jesus Christ. Peter preaches the gospel. And over 3,000 people are saved because Peter obeyed Jesus' words from, late, from earlier that night. I pray for you that your faith will not fail. And you, addressing Peter, verse 31, he's addressing all of the disciples. Verse 32 of Luke chapter 22, he's talking specifically to Peter. And so he says, and you, Peter, when you have returned back, strengthen your brothers. There may be times that we do fail. There may be times that we do fall. But know that Christ has prayed for you. And he expects the same obedience. He expects the same response out of us as he did from Peter. When you have repented and you return to me, faith is never in question. But our devotion can sometimes be in question. He says, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brothers. Maybe you've been knocked down You've been ran over. You've been beaten up. You've been thrown up into the air. But you've never gotten over it. You've never gotten past it. You're still struggling. Still suffering. Maybe you still have some questions. Jesus said, get up. Return to me. God uses these experiences like the experience of Peter for our good. It's to refine our character and to strengthen our faith. But it's also an avenue for us to comfort others and ultimately to make us more like Jesus. So when you're hitting them a tough time, when you're knocked down, when you're being run over, when you're getting beat up, you think you just can't take it anymore and then you get thrown up into the air. Just remember, Christ is on your side. He's prayed for you. And that's not it. He's got something else in store for you. Let's pray. <clears throat> I follow you. Just pause for a moment. And as we look into your